Warning. 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 N- now for a word of caution. The information you are about to hear is the exact knowledge they don't want you to know. Only on the Bridge Podcast, hosted by Travis Haley. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Bridge. Uh, today, I got a, an awesome guest, Tyler Vargas Andrews, man. You uh, uh, you got a story to tell today, and I'm, I think uh, can help a lot of people understand a little bit more about, you know, what's going on, not only in your life, but maybe in, in the you know, the, in the world, especially in the conflict that you were just involved in. And, and for those that don't know, you know, I've been spending a lot of time with, with your guys, uh, from, from Victor two one and, and, and the, and even the Mew guys, uh, that were on the special purpose MAGTAF <clears throat> crisis response in, in the Kabul evacuation. And, and Tyler was one of the most critically injured Marines that was there. And, uh, Tyler said he would love to come on and, and, and share your story, man. So thanks for coming, brother. Thank you for having me. Seriously. Yeah, man. Uh, excited to be here. So I think first off, before we get into the meat, you know, and talking about Afghanistan, talking about what happened and, and what you're dealing with now and where you're going in life. Um, give us, give us a, a little glimpse into, you know, who you are, like, where'd you come from, man? What, what's your, what's your life before and, and maybe all the way up to Afghanistan? Yeah. So I, uh, originally, uh, born and raised in Northern California, um, raised by a single mother, and uh, it's kind of where, where I get my personality from, <laughs> definitely. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, born just shy of Sacramento, California. Um, family now resides a little above that. And, uh, you know, grew up um, uh, not too big of a hometown, not too small, but um, grew up playing sports, kind of typical. Uh, my, mom, my mom threw me into sports from an early age. Um, what would you play? Uh, soccer and baseball, primarily. Kind of played a little bit of everything, but stuck with soccer and baseball. Um, Got injured my freshman year of high school in baseball and then just stuck out soccer. Um, went to college for a year um, to appease my mom. She's very, um, <laughs> she's an attorney, um, runs her own law firm, very um, academia oriented. Sure. And uh, I was all about um, enlisting in the Marine Corps. And so she she was like, just just try school. You can try school for a year. You know, you can still, you know, enlist in the military. She was always very supportive, but uh, she was like, you know, kind of pleased. And I was like, all right, well, I love you. I'll, I'll give school a shot. It means I can play, you know, soccer at a at a junior college for a little bit longer. And uh, got got about a semester in, and I was like, no, nope, mom, this is not fucking for me. I, uh, I'm going. <laughs> what t- what age was that now? Uh, nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah. Okay. How long did you know you wanted to go into Marines before that? Um, probably since I was uh, a sophomore in high school. I had always I hadn't. My great uncle, um, he was in the Air Force. Um, other than that, I didn't have anyone in my life who was military, um, and we grew up uh, next to Travis Air Force Base, yeah. and, or I did, uh, next to Travis Air Force Base, and so I did the junior ROTC program there for, for almost two years um, before I moved, and, you know, all my friends had, mil- they were military families and stuff, and, you know, there was always that, like, you know, I was like, well, I have I have to do this, I, you know, I can't have, I can't have other people go and, you know, sacrifice, make their own sacrifices for this country if I'm not willing to. And it was just always a, uh, you know, something I wanted to do. And I had actually wanted to be, uh, you know, everyone, young, a lot of young kids want to be fighter pilots. And I had always wanted to be a fighter pilot and uh, found out that I was color deficient. So not color blind, but uh, kind of color stupid. So uh, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't do the, uh, do the pilot thing. And I was like, well, fuck, uh, you know, what's, what's the best, what's the next best thing? And I was like, you know what? I looked in the Marine Corps. Uh, Marines are kind of always in your face, obviously nice uniform, uh, it was just like, man, you know what? I was like, I'm glad I can't be a pilot. I want to be a fucking Marine. And uh, didn't look back from then on. I was like, I'm going to be a Marine. I remember I, I told my mom that. I was like, Mom, I'm, I'm going to listen to the Marine Corps. And she bawled her eyes out. She was like, you're not, I can't believe you. <laughs> you're not going to, you know, what if you get hurt? All the typical mom stuff. Oh, but, oh I'm going to be a JAG. It's yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she was she was very supportive. Um, and uh, throughout high school and stuff, you know, I didn't. I hated school. Uh, you know, we went through went through some uh, some pretty severe family trauma with my biological father uh, when I was um, you know a young uh, young kid. I was about twelve, thirteen, and uh, he had he was he was not in the picture um, until I was about seven, and he came back into our lives for a little bit. Um, fortunately, you know, gave my mom and I my my younger sister and younger brother. So very thankful for that. But uh, you know, he was. Uh, pretty messed up in the head um uh he was a child molester and uh you know that that was a big um 
big turning point for me where I was like, you know, I, I want to help people. I want to give back and I want to, you know, help those who can't help themselves. And, you know, I saw a lot of, you know, I saw a lot of um, innocent lives get hurt because of him. And, uh, you know, made me, kind of gave me that, my why. And, you know, mm. the reason why I wanted to, wanted to serve my country and give back to, uh, you know, people in other nations, even if it was just, you know, impacting, you know, um, you know, domestic lives here or, or, you know, foreign overseas. Um, you know, I felt like it was my, my responsibility to give back to those in need. That's incredible, man. I acknowledge you for sharing that. I appreciate Not that. A lot of people would. Um, and speaking of that, you know, you know, as you know, I, I believe the world's a forum and, and sharing is, is, mm -hmm. uh, um, it's almost like the whole sharing is caring concept, but I think sharing is seeding, right? Yeah. It, it really helps us understand what people go through in their lives, not just military and, you know, getting shot up and blown up and, and seeing traumatic things, but your, your life in general, it all characterizes who you are and the ability to share that is incredible. So that's awesome, brother. Well, speaking of that, um, you know, you, you know, with the military aspect, you now move into that. Um, how did your life change once you got in the military? Um, it was, you know, I think, I think most people going into going into the military, especially, you know, infantry combat arms and OS, they have an idea of, you know, what it's going to be like. Um, and you know, some of the, some of the military lives up to that. Um, you know, a lot of it's like, wow, this is not what I expected. Um, but it was, you know, I had a friend who put it in a really, really good way. Um, he was like, you know, my, he was like, my, he was national guard and he said that, you know, his buddies always still be like, you know, why are you, why do you care so much? Why are you, you know, you know, you know, so good at this, you know, potentially. And, and then, you know, they brought it up like, you know, this is your sport. And, uh, I was like, wow, that's actually, I've never heard that before, but you know, I, I uh, you know, the military, the, the, you know, the being in the infantry and stuff, I felt like it was, it was meant to be, um, you know, where I was at, it was, uh, you know, much around a, har a lot of hardworking people. Um, and you know, I just, I busted my ass to be, you know, the best version of myself that I could be. And, uh, you know, I held that expectation for, you know, people around me. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of good leadership early on in the Marine Corps and uh, kind of instilled the, the, the values that my mom raised me with. Um, and just being a good fucking person, you know, they they upheld that. And uh, it gave me a lot of room to, to grow and to just increase my potential. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So fast forward, you guys, you get all the way into Afghanistan. Well, actually, if you want to start, you guys were down in Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, we were, you know, we were part of the, um, special person, special purpose MAGTAF crisis response. Um, originally stopped in Kuwait for a little bit and then, uh, went to Saudi Arabia as a, as a show of force for Iran. Um, and just kind of did, you know, uh, taught a lot of classes to the, the line platoons that were there, um, worked in with them, did rotations to Kuwait to use the army sniper range there. Um, you know, went, went to as many ranges with, with the line platoons as we could, um, just being the, the one state team attached to that company out there and being with the flagpole. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was primarily what we were doing in Saudi, just training. It's a lot of training. And then you guys get the, the call, the balloon goes up yeah. and then what happens? So, uh, you know, we, uh, we had a pretty good relationship with the, uh, the Colonel of the SP MAGTAF and he was always trying to reel us in, give us, you know, give us updates on what was going on. And we were always pushing for information as well. And, uh, we were in, we were in Kuwait, um, at the time using, using the range, uh, the army sniper range out there and working with one of the line platoons and, uh, you know, kind of got that, uh, got that word back from Saudi that were like, Hey, you guys, you guys are going to go. And, uh, you know, everyone had been dying to go for, you know, probably a month or two at that point. Obviously, yeah, June, July, all of June and July, it was like, you know, like, send us, send us. And uh, even, the you know, it seemed like the colonel wanted that as well, pushing for the SP Mac to have to go. And at whatever point above him, it got shut down. Um, but, uh, you know, we we were like, okay, like, maybe we'll go because we kind of kept getting, you know, dicked around a little bit, like, you know, you're going to go, you're not going to go, you might go. Okay, now you are probably going to go. And, uh, you know, it was exciting, but I think the real, the real moment it hit us was, uh, our team corpsman, he came into, into our tent and he was like, it's fucking real guys. And we're like, you know, what's up? What, what do you mean? And, uh, he pulls out his, his med pack, you know, with all the drugs and stuff. And 
you know, <laughs> Corman don't get that shit unless they're going to go do shit. Right. And, uh, so he's, he's showing me all of his stuff and just letting, letting us know where it's at. Um, what's what. And, uh, he did a good job on, you know, we, we, we took, you know, our medical training as serious as, I mean, you know, how it is bullets and band-aids took everything as serious as we could. And, uh, you know, when he showed us that, I was like, wow, like, Oh fuck. Like we are going, we're actually going. And, uh, for me, um, you know, I think for a lot of the guys too, it was kind of like, there was a little bit of anxiety in a, in a good way, but it was just like pure excitement. You know, we had grown up seeing, at least for me and, um, I mean, all the guys on the team, um, you know, we'd grown up with, you know, the older generations like yourself and, you know, guys we looked up to just wanted to go and fucking get some, you know, go and impact the world in a positive way. And, you know, whether that's, you know, um, you know, dealing with bad guys or dealing with people who just need help. And, uh, it was exciting. It was really exciting because it was like, wow, you know, my first time stepping foot over like in the Middle East was was four years in the Marine Corps. And, uh, you know, it's like I explained it to my mom. I was like, you know, it'd be like you, you know, taking the bar and doing all this training, all these, you know, exams and whatnot and practice like, you know, preparing to practice law, but never actually being able to go into the court and actually, you know, practice law and uh, or, you know, training for a baseball team, but never playing in a game. Um, you know, that, that was, that was hard for, that's hard for a lot. I think any, any young, uh, military member, especially in a, a combat arms MOS nowadays is it's, it's rare. Um, and even more so now that the, you know, the war is over, um, per se. And, uh, it was, it was very exciting. So you guys get there, right? Um, can you guys, can you, and of course everybody's seen it on video and a lot of the pictures and stuff, but can, can you give us your optics of, of what you saw there when you first got there? Like d- describe the situation, the people, the environment, the chaos, yeah. um, or maybe not chaos. I don't know. You, yes. You, you paint us that picture. <laughs> so, um, our, um, our assistant team leader, he, uh, he got sent a day early with the quartering party. Um, and, uh, Chaz, my team leader and I, we, we stayed in, uh, Stay in the crick or the croc, whatever it was, looking on, um, you know, drone like live live drone uh, footage, making sure that they landed safely. Uh, they he went with one one uh, line platoon, and it was I mean it was absolute chaos that that day. Um, you know, we were watching the Taliban outside the gates of the airport, just like shooting people. Um, people were climbing the fences, breaking into the airport, and so when they got there, um, excuse me. Um, you know, thousands of people broke into the airport and it was just, you know, like Victor 1-8, um, some of the 82nd Airborne guys and uh, a platoon of Marines and uh, an our guy. And they just stayed up, you know, for, for 24 to 36 hours, pushing thousands of people back across this airfield trying to, you know, create space. Um, you know, we, we have no idea who all these people are, um, you know, what their intentions are. The A is breaking down at that point, um, and uh, yeah, that I mean, it was chaos when we when our the rest of our team got on the ground. You know, we were, we were about thirty minutes out um, in a C one thirty, and they blocked us out because they were like, "Oh, you know, you're taking taking machine gun fire, rocket fire, and stuff." And uh, we we didn't get hit or anything, but um, you know, it was that moment. I was like, I said it out loud to everyone kind of in there. We were attached to another, uh, or we we went over there with another platoon, and. Uh, I was like, wow. I looked around. It was like really hitting me. I was like, man, I was like, this is, you know, this is all of our dreams as a young kid. This is every young man's dream, every old man's nightmare. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I think that's even more so true now for, you know, you know the, the situation that happened and, uh, you know, the, the attack um, on the 26th. But it uh, there was a young PFC, two seats over, and um, one of my one of my best friends, he was a squad leader at the time, and his uh, one of his guys um, – the young PFC, he was just started hyperventilating and he was just breathing really, really heavy and he was freaking out and he was, he was like, like, like corporal, corporal, I, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Like I'm scared. I'm scared. And you know, they, they did their best calm them down and stuff, but it was, you know, he was a guy who'd gotten to, uh, who'd gotten to the company like f- three, four months before we deployed. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys over the years have been in that situation, but, uh, it was, it was new because the rest of us, you know, we'd been training for, for years, to get to this point, hopefully. And, uh, you know, we got on the ground and we all, you know, come off guns a blazing thinking it's going to be crazy. And luckily our boys the day before had, you know, they had, um, courted in the whole, the whole airport and, uh, it was pretty anticlimactic. We got off and, you know, guys are like sitting in on security and these like random, random, um, 
army guys like or army army girls came uh came strolling up just like kevlar off like hey guys like what's up like welcome to afghanistan We're like okay <laughs> like what the, what's going on here and so i was like like <laughs> your ass like get the fuck up guys or puckering yeah. on the on the ride in and yeah. then you're like greeted by yeah that's yeah. funny yeah, and like my, one of our guys on our team he was like laying in the front i was like i was like cooper get get the fuck up i was <laughs> yeah. like we're fine like <laughs> get the fuck up we're, we're going and uh Went, went, dropped our shit off, staged in a gym, uh, just an abandoned gym and, you know, went back, grabbed packs and then, you know, right away just trying to, trying to, trying to get some, trying to do something, trying to be of use. Um, you know, went and found, uh, the, the other team, uh, that we had out there, um, and the weapon, weapons company guys and, uh, just linked up with them trying to see where we could be of use. Yeah. And what was your, what was the actual mission when you guys were told in Saudi Arabia that, hey, you're going in, what's, it, it's, it's obviously a crisis response, but you know, what was the mission they told you this is what we're going in to do? Yeah. So it was a, a Neo non-combatant, non-combatant evacuation operation. Um, and we had trained that a few times, uh, spent a couple of days training in Saudi, setting up, setting up lanes. You know, they told us, Hey, all of these refugees are coming out, people with special, special immigrant visas, um, you know, American passports, other allied nation passports and stuff that were citizens that we're going to be pulling out. Um, and so obviously when we were at, we were at, um, you know, Prince Sultan Air Base, uh, all the Army and um, Air Force um, personnel that were there, they would come and we'd set up la- set up lanes and they'd walk through and we had an urban hide set up in a van um, or mobile hide set up in a van and, uh, you know, just kind of watching people for, um, you know, potential IDs, potential threats and stuff. And, you know, they would just, they would let thousands of people from the base go through um, just to try and process them and get some, get some reps at processing them. And uh, they told us that's what we were going there for. And, you know, that's what we did. It was just, uh, it was very, very, very chaotic, um, to say the least. But there wasn't, there was no way anyone could have, uh, you know, verbally or physically prepared us for, for what, what happened out there, I would say. Um, it was you know, times a thousand to what we had trained at. Um, it definitely, you know, I spoke about this earlier, but it definitely gave us uh gave us a foundation at least understanding like what we what some like what people needed to do but um you know the the couple hundred people that came through those those lanes did not compare to the hundreds of thousands of people packed outside the airport hundreds of thousands yeah people. and the ANA is pretty dispersed at this point they're they're basically nothing yeah. right yeah and you know they're talking with the Taliban they're outside the gates working with them some of them are the Taliban you know we don't know what but we we roll up and you know, the ANA, we we were driving around. I remember we came out to a gate where one of our teams was at the first first or second night, and uh, we were pulling them off their position. And, uh, like, all the ANA just, without a word, just packed up and left, and that was it and didn't yeah. say anything. Yeah. yeah. And so as far as the, the, the Taliban, they're 100 meters from you, right? Yeah. They're sitting right there watching you guys. You're, Why? How does that feel? You know, to know, like, and yeah. I know you, you didn't serve in Afghanistan before that yet. Yeah. But <clears throat> to know we've been in – contact right and 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 fighting and negotiating with the taliban for for 20 years now what's it like to sit there and look at that that other side right there in front of your face i mean it it was it was pretty pretty fucking surreal honestly it was like why the fuck can i do my job you know why can't i shoot (laughs) these guys i mean i know for a lot of the older guys um you know been there done that you know i've watched watched a lot of senior guys and we all did break down you know, they'd go out and help the families, you know, come into the base of our tower once we had moved out to Abbey Gate forward and just break down because, you know, the uh, the Taliban, they, we were like, hey, don't mess with them. Let them come up, work with them. And we're like, fuck that. But do they ever explain why? Because a lot of people don't know that. You know, they don't know the relationship with the Taliban. I mean, we, we negotiate with them. We talk to yeah. them on a daily basis. It's not like we're in this, you know, it's the man in the black pajamas through the jungle. It wasn't that way after yeah. 20 years. Um, so we know we've always been communicating with them, but to have them that close in person, knowing that they're waiting for your ass to leave, yeah. um, talk, can you talk to the ROEs, like the, the rules of engagement um, yeah. and, and why they said, Hey, work with them versus shoot them. Is there any type of, yeah. of legal law there that said, Hey, here's why we're not doing this. Yeah. So there, there definitely was a, what's a why, um, to an extent. So they, you know, um, you know, that we got to the gate and, uh, by the time we'd gotten to abrogate proper or abrogate forward, I think it was maybe three days in, three days into us being there. Um, you know, the 515 task force commander, um, who's in charge of all the operations out there, uh, came up, you know, um, went out there, met with the Taliban leader that was out there. Um, you know, 
did their agreement and came back and told us like, hey, you know, they're going to help us evacuate civilians. Um, they won't they won't fuck with us, fuck with us if we don't fuck with them. And uh, you know, they're they had a checkpoint about 150 meters, 150 yards in front of us um, from our tower, looking straight out out into the city. And uh, you know, we we would have guys consistently come through, men, women, children, just beat up, bloodied, um, because the Taliban would fuck them up because they're, hey, they're trying to leave to America. We'll let them through, but, you know, we're going to kill them. Guys, I mean, we're going to, we're going to beat them and stuff. Um, Guys we sent back, they would just execute on the spot. Guys who didn't come through, um, you know, they, they. So they were shooting them right there. Yeah, shooting them, beating them to death, um, you know, 150 yards in front of us. And obviously we were in an elevated position. Um, in the tower and uh with you know with high powered optics and cameras and whatnot and um it's clear, hard clear day views. yeah i mean it was night out night after night day after day um it, it was uh it was hard i mean it, I, th- I think all the guys in our team especially being on the gun showed uh, an enormous amount of restraint especially the guys on the ground but it was um you know that's that's something that every person out there has to live with you know i, I mean they they killed countless civilians just because they couldn't make it through or if they just felt like doing it because they could you know and uh they even you know at certain points brought taliban up to the up to the gate you know we got pictures and stuff um of the taliban right next to marines you know closer than you and i are sitting here um beating beating civilians in front of them and it's like don't do anything you know, like we're in, that's where I mean I don't know shit about shit right with what happened there I'm to, so far detached from Afghanistan but <clears throat> How does one task force commander make that decision to work with an enemy? Yeah. I mean, again, I'm sure there's some weird shit behind the scenes that yeah. that's the bigger question, right? Because we only know what we know at that level, at the ground level. Yeah. Uh, but that task force, what was he, a colonel, general? I'm not sure, to be honest. I okay. don't remember. Um, so I think that information comes from higher than those two definitely. people having a meeting. Yeah. And, it de- it definitely there's an does. agenda there, obviously, right? Yeah. I'm not trying to talk conspiracies or anything, but there's definitely something there that's that's out of, out of whack, man, yeah. from what normal operating procedures would have been where there typically would have been a negotiation. Hey, you stop beating and killing these people, you let them through, and if you do, we're going to fucking kill you. Yeah. And they're like, all right, we'll let them through, we'll help you. Okay, but there's there's two sides of this deal, boy, so be careful yeah. your the words and the actions that you make next. Um, typically has happened. I've seen that in Africa. I've seen it in Iraq, um, but not there. You know, that's, do, yeah. you, do you feel that's a... Um, an intel or maybe a leadership issue overall or yeah. is it just too chaotic to even to to say that i, I think it's you know it's a, it's a little bit of both because it's you know i mean with any any um any kind of situation like that i think uh you know it's it's like well if we start shooting at them you know then they start shooting at us and you know do more of us get injured do more of us get killed yeah we stop you know civilians from getting shot but now these you know these refugees can't get out through this checkpoint um, the ones that do make it through. So it's definitely a back and forth. Um, you know, I, I'd, ha- I'd like to think from, from whatever leadership above, of him, above, above us was like, you know, this is going to be potentially the, the least loss of life. Um, if this happens, but you know, we all, we all have our own opinions on how the government's ran, how the military's ran. But, uh, I think that's, that's the way a lot of us have to look at it. The guys who are out there, the men and women, um, it's like, you know, Definitely, if we start shooting, they're going to shoot back. You know, they have gun trucks in front of us. Um, you know, we <laughs> we're up there with the Sasser with Rafa's rounds and uh, you know a couple other long guns. But it's like there's some gun trucks. There's some stuff that you know a lot of, a lot of death yeah. is going to happen yeah, before it's of, neutralized. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, you can't you can't decipher through thousands of people running around yeah. while you're shooting. You know, exactly. that's hard. That's a that's a mission you can't like you said you train for you train for it, but you can never imagine what it's actually like when it gets to that point. Yeah, of total. <clears throat> terrible horrible catastrophe is really what that situation turns into so with that um as far as the leadership the intelligence aspect of it you know there's a bunch of hearsay and this and that but you know there's there's i've heard that they actually had a pid on the bomber and where he came from um do you have any anything on that yeah so um it was probably on uh you know throughout the the whole time we were at the gate we were getting um you know potential v-bid um you know, potential suicide bomber um, warnings and, uh, you know, like a gold Corolla that kept coming up a lot. Um, Toyota Corolla. Um, the, I think our, our third day at the gate, um, 
the army brought out a bunch of shipping containers and put like three of them in front of us next to the Baron Hotel to um, provide standoff for any of bids that could come up to us. So that, that was good. Um, but it also allowed the Taliban on the other side to um, mm. get away with murdering more people um, other than us because we could see it from an elevated position. So but, exercise and compromise, what yeah, do you do? Yeah. You know? And, um, you know, so uh, we... Sorry, can you repeat repeat that question? As far, again? Sorry. As, far as the the ID on the bomber yeah. himself, because didn't he come from India or something like that? Yeah. So, um, so according to the investigation, um, you know, the guy who detonated the, the detonated the vest, the backpack, uh, he had previously been picked up by some you know some CIA operatives years prior or uh, some other um, intelligence organization working working out there. Um, picked him up in uh, New Delhi, and. Uh, Put him in a prison uh, just just west of uh, Kabul, right. and uh, you know as the Taliban takeover started happening, they started you know going in trying to kill ISIS ISIS leaders in, in the prisons, but letting out everyone else. And uh, you know Bagram fell, and uh, they they released that prison close in it, closest to Kabul, and uh, he was in there, you know, and they had they had uh, apprehended him previously for a suicide bombing attempt, um, thwarted that, and then um, you know. If, if it was that same guy, you know, he got away with it. Uh, they, they uh, that, I think it was a, maybe 1.30 a.m. or so on the 26th. Um, you know, we, we were talking with our Intel guys and, uh, uh, you know, they were giving us, you know, more. Um, that pictures had, of him yeah, and stuff? Yeah, paint, painting pictures. Of, well, uh, we didn't get a, we didn't get a solid picture of him um, uh, given up to us from Intel, but we had been given description, a very specific description of who he was, who he was with, um, where he was coming from, the way he was going to come and uh, come through the canal and stuff. And, um, you know, the uh, some, some PSYOPs guys came up and they talked to us, get, you know, told us the same thing um, up in the tower. And, uh, you know, that we passed that to all the units that, that morning. Um, you know, we had had... Uh, a few times, but the, the Taliban um, had sent out, you know, guys doing ID probes um, throughout the canal, um, throughout the the field to the to the left of our tower. Um, and we had a team, you know, behind us, um, you know, a couple hundred yards um, in another tower, and uh, they were they were picking up on that, picking up on the vehicles they were rolling in with, with all the same make and model like backpacks and whatnot and duffel bags, and uh, so. Uh, that that morning, you know, we had uh, we had stopped when we watched these guys drop out with uh, with the duffel bag, drop coming to the crowd, drop the duffel bag. We had, you know we got we caught on them right away and uh, got EOD out there. You know, went to investigate. You know, what, it wasn't anything. You know, um, wasn't wasn't an ID, but it was a probe. And uh, mm. you know, everyone kind of went back about their business. You know, we were just told keep going. Um, you know. Uh, you know, keep, keep, just keep pulling people out. You know, the gate's still open. We still need to get people out. And you're just funneling people like crazy, trying to yeah. get them through and checking them. Kids, women, yep. babies. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, we had, you know, we had the canal right next to our, our tower that was just filled with, you know, tens of thousands of people. I mean, I, the best way I would describe it is if I was to fill this whole room up with sand, like that's how packed it was with people. I mean, there were, mm. you know, there were people holding their babies above their heads so they wouldn't get crushed. People were getting trampled to death. I mean... It, you know, people dying from dehydration, malnutrition, let alone the Taliban. Um, it was uh, it was chaos. I mean, the the canal itself, um, you know, it was just nasty sewage water, and it got to a point where people were coming through that because they wanted to escape. Um, and uh, you know, we had many times, a lot of times, it's like these people don't have documents, kick them out, you know, take them back out, and they're you know, that's the uh, the Department of State guys telling us that. Um, and, you know, I'm walking, you know, I, I mean, I had to do myself a few times with some kids, but people, um, you know, Marines just walking, having to walk people out, you know, they're like, hey, we, we can't let you in. And people are just clawing at, at their uniforms, dragging on them, like grabbing their muzzles, like fucking kill me. The Taliban's going to rape and murder me and my family. Like, if you're not going to let us in, kill me, you know, and, you know, a few instances where people tried to kill themselves on the razor wire because they didn't want to live that life of tyranny really? you know, above them. And, uh. I mean, there's everyone's got stories like that out there, but I mean, definitely from from our hey, point of view, we typi- saw it. You typically all the time. hear the C-17, the people falling from the yeah. plane, which is another huge indicator of how badly people want this. Yeah. How not, desperate? Not even freedom. They just want to get the hell away from the tyranny that yeah. is happening there. Um, 
Can you, can you tell us about that as far as you, know, you made a comment earlier about <clears throat> um, how hard that is to describe to people, you know, yeah. and I think that's what uh, what uh, Americans need to hear. And I think yeah. that's the problem with us and the military and the government is we don't talk about these things enough. I'm not talking about classified crap or giving away, you know, tricks of the trade. I'm talking about the 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 sacrifices of people of human life around the world that you know in this country we have everything we possibly could ever want every opportunity um so can you, can you speak to that grat that gratitude or that Definitely. appreciation aspect yeah i mean um you know th these these people are so desperate to get away from from a life of tyranny and uh have an opportunity at a good life you know the the average american you know will never will never truly understand what that what that sac like the sacrifice of you know the men and women who serve is going over there, um, going overseas, doing these things so that, you know, people can, you know, I'm not here to preach, but bitch and moan about the things that they bitch and moan about. Um, you know, there are a lot of patriot Amer Americans that are thankful, but that, that opportunity at a life free of tyranny and just a life of opportunity in, in the U.S. or other allied nations, these people are so desperate to have. I mean, it, it's, you've been to, you know, you've been to foreign nations and you've seen how corrupt and just the degradation of other countries is and i mean these people were s the people that we did that we did save and we did pull out i mean a lot of them were in tears they were so thankful they were un unbelievably happy i mean they have they have a life now because of that a life they would never have had nothing compared to the life that they're going to be able to to and lead nobody will ever be able to comprehend what's in that person's mind that yeah. is now free and knowing that half their family or most of their family is dead exactly um yeah, you know, I think I think a lot of Americans, or the free world, I should say, which isn't very big anymore, um, would would say, "Screw those people, man! They shouldn't have been there anyways." <laughs> yeah. It's like imagine when that happens here in this country. Um, what are people going to be thinking then? Exactly. Right, because right now we don't have to worry about that. And then people go, "Oh, well, Travis, nothing's going to happen in this country." Well, first off, less than three people ago, it did happen in this country. Right, we had our own civil wars, our own our own revolutions. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean that that can't happen here. And, uh, you know, and I know we're going to turn things around in this country. We have to. We're the freest country on the face of the planet. We, do. Uh, we have the best resources, the best food, the best ports. And, you know, everybody else wants that. No other country in the world really has what we have here. We're an anomaly in the world. We are. Um, and so people will easily fall into that that uh, American mentality like, well, you know how many times you heard, well, turn it into a, a parking lot. We won't have to worry about those people anymore. Like, dude, some of those people saved our lives. I yeah, trusted those exactly. people with, like, Terps and, and informants and, and friends and A&A and &A &A and, or the Iraqi Army or in Africa or any places that I've personally served. Um, I, I trusted these people with my life. Yeah. And so regardless of their religious beliefs or ideology, um, you know, people forget about that. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's you know, I mean, I couldn't say any better. Uh, America is an anomaly. Um it's it's you know it's more commonplace to to live in a shitty fucking world, uh, live in a shitty place in another country, and uh, it definitely um, <laughs> I mean it, it's uh, you know th those people I think you know what people don't realize is there's you know there's good humans in, in shitty places too you know and I mean I'm uh, I, everyone out there who is able to touch and positively impact people's lives um, you know whether it's the work that you you did yourself personally or the work that we did pulling people out. Um, you know, I mean, it, it was an absolute honor. You know, th those people are going to be thankful for the rest of their lives. They're going to contribute to society. I mean, I have no doubt about that. They're going to have the opportunity, you know, scientists, doctors, whatever they may be. If they're going to fucking work at McDonald's, fuck yeah, I want some French fries. Thank you. Right. Absolutely. Everybody's going to start yeah. somewhere, man. And that, that starts with liberation and freedom to be able to do what we want to do in our yeah. lives. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people hear that and be like, yeah, but we got our own problems here, Tyler, you know, in America. It's like, do we? <laughs> <laughs> we I, do of course yeah. we do uh but when you can see it through that lens that you've seen it through uh, and it's it, it i used to have this um uh you know guys get homesick right like oh i want to go home i want to see mom it's been a year it's been whatever um a lot of guys get away sick right because when you spend that much time in that that horrible uh poverty stricken and tyrannical evil world um like the places that you, you know you've seen and you, you tend to you tend to come home and I got away sick. I hated being here. Yeah. I think a lot of guys probably feel that. You know, the guys that want to go over and continue to help the rest of the world make it a better place and what they came in it. 
And uh, so you come back here and you get kind of like, Ugh, I feel a little bit weird, icky, man. I feel I don't I have everything I possibly want. I yeah. want to I want to I want to go back into that world because I feel good there. Yeah. I feel good there in a horrible, terrible environment because while I'm there, I get to appreciate what I get to come back home exactly. to. And then when I come back home, so I'm like, fuck, I got to get out of here again. Yeah. And you're seeing you're seeing, you know, the value of, of your impact on other people and other societies. Yeah. It's, it's, it's addictive. It's infectious. It's, yeah. it's addictive. Um, you know, helping people and, um, you know, so, so with that, uh, I think it's a good time to segue into, um, the actual event that happens yeah. now. Um, and, and with that, before the, before the bomb goes off, was there any contact made between Marines or army or anybody to Taliban or anybody or ISIS at that point, or it was pretty much just them killing people. And then all of a sudden, boom, things light off. Was there anything that, cause I never heard about any other contact that potentially yeah. happened before. Um, so not to my knowledge, other than the, the task force commander going out there and, you know, having the discussion and then the Taliban, some of the Taliban, um, uh, individuals coming up to, to the gate and whatnot and working around us and trying to do more crowd control and stuff right next to Marines. Um, <clears throat> but not to my knowledge, other than that. And we know ISIS was there too, right? Yeah. Or IS. Um, what was their deal with, but could you decipher between any of those guys? I mean, you probably don't see the ISIS guys, but the, the Taliban was fighting them or supposedly trying to hold them back, but I don't yeah. think they were. They're collaborating yeah. for the most part because they're the ones that are letting these guys through and they know they got best on because they're searching people. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, um, you know, that what they kept telling us is, and even now, you know, still telling people is like, oh, you know, the Taliban and ISIS don't like each other. Well, that might be the case, but they like Americans less. Yeah. Um, they and, have a common enemy. Yeah. The intimacy. Yeah. Okay. So this guy sneaks through. Um, and what's happening at this time? Well, I know because I know I knew Hunter really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know a lot of the guys and, and uh, before he was killed there. Um, what was going on? Because I've heard some of the stories about how they were they were evacuating people actively at that point in time. And then all of a sudden, boom, it detonates. Yeah. It goes off. So, so that morning, um, you know, we, we had um, eyes on who – you know, we believe fit the description of the bomber and the description we were given. Um, and, uh, you know, pass it up, you know, kind of requesting engagement authority because at that point it was like, don't fucking shoot anyone unless, like, we saw someone with, you know, a grenade in their hand or, you know, actually had a vest on or was getting sh we were getting shot at. And so we requested engagement authority, kept kept calling it up. I, I was, you know, I was a radio, radio team operator for our team and uh, kept asking what's going on. And eventually, you know, our battalion commander came up kind of same questions were asked, um, you know, given, uh, given from all echelons of leadership above us, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the engagement criteria is. So all leadership um, is coming back saying, we don't know either. Yeah. And you know, everyone, everyone kind of left, kind of tried to figure out what was going on, never got an answer back. And at that point guy disappeared into the crowd. Um, and that was probably around, you know, maybe, maybe noon to around 1 PM in the afternoon. Um, and we, you know, we passed every time something happened, we passed up, you know, over the net down to our buddies down there working in the canal. Um, you know, what was going on and stuff. And it was just like, Oh, you know, keep, all right, well, keep going about your, keep going about your day, keep helping people. And, uh, you know, our team. So obviously, you know, we've got, got a shooter spotter pair up top. Um, and, um, you know, if we had the, had a uh, spotting scope up there, we'd have some, another, a third person taking pictures and stuff, um, or s vice versa. Um, so we had, you know, seven guys at the gate for our team. Um, the rest of us would be down helping the canal, um, helping every, all the line platoons would uh, rotate out every 12 hours from the canal, um, pulling refugees out. And, uh, you know, we, w we were going in as much as we could. I mean, we didn't, we didn't sleep much out there. It wasn't like, that's, I'm not saying that a bad way. We just, we wanted to help. And, uh, you know, that's what we were there to do. So our team would go down all day, all night long when, when operations are being conducted and help out as much as we could. We'd be pulling guys out, um, pulling family members out. And, uh, you know, when that happened, um, we, I had just, they had, you know, kind of sent us back to uh, a few guys at a time to tighten up the rucks and stuff that we had staged and whatnot, um, make sure everything was good to go. Cause they were like, you know, the gate's going to close and we're going to, we're going to get, we're going to bounce. And, uh, you know, I got back, um, and I was back with uh, with Aunt, um, uh, RGFO on our team, and um, he and I were shooter spotter pair up there. The other guys went back, um, and our team corpsman and uh, one of the other guys, um, our assistant RO, came back, and uh, my buddy, uh, Staff Sergeant Darren Hoover, he um, 
he came up to the base of the tower and he was like, Hey, like snipes. And I was like looking down the ladder. I was like, what's up, man? And I was on the gun at the time. And he's like, Hey, like at that time we were waiting for an interpreter that, um, I can't remember whose interpreter it was, but we were always trying to help guys who would reach out to us, you know, via social media and whatnot. And, um, pull out guys that they had worked with and guys who would help them. And, uh, we were waiting for this one specific guy and, uh, you know, um, he's like, Hey, there's an interpreter down here. I think he's an interpreter, uh, with another guy, you know, he's got a sign that says like, uh, Dalton two, one stay on it. And I was like, Oh, that, that's who we're looking for. Uh, that's the guy we're looking for. We told him to write that on it mm. on his sign. And I was like, all right. I was like, you know, uh, one, I can't remember which guy I told him, I was like, hey, hop on the gun. Like I'm going to go down and fucking pull this guy out. Um, and whoever he's with, um, make sure they have good documents and stuff. And, um, remember, I remember getting asked, like, are you sure? Like, you want me to go down? I was like, like, no, like we need a, we need a shooter spotter pair up here at least. Like nothing's going to fucking happen, but like we need a shooter spotter pair up here. And, uh, you know, I went down the ladder well, um, grabbed my gun. We walked out, uh, and you know, about we had, uh, from our tower to the right side of the tower was the main gate. Um, and then there was a fence line that ran straight out from our tower on holding the left edge of it. And about 70 yards down, there was a hole that was cutting the fence, uh, to get into the canal itself. And so all the crowd was right here and the Marines, um, pulling them back to, pulling them back to the check, like the search, search area to the right, right inside the gate. And, um, I'm walking out, I'm talking with, uh, with Hoover and, uh, just kind of talking about how fucking chaotic and just insane the situation was. And, uh, you know, we go out there, um, I pulled the pull interpreter out. Um, you know, I remember looking at the sign. I was like, oh, this is pretty fucking cool. Like, he's got this sign, says my buddy's name on it, um, you know, who we are, and put it in my pocket. I was like, all right, I'm going to keep this. And I'm talking to this interpreter, and, you know, all the Marines around us, all those Gulf Company Marines that were out there, um, you know, they're still pulling guys out, checking paperwork, just going back and forth, trying to get as many people out as we could. Because at that point, they had told us, you know, uh, the gates, like, sh they had already told us, like, hey, the gate's going to be closed, like, an hour prior. And it uh, still hadn't been closed, so we were still out there working. And um, I'm down there. Uh, I set the interpreter down because uh, he, he had good papers and stuff. He's like, oh, this is like my brother. And so I checked his paperwork. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to, like, did a hasty search on him. I'm going to take you guys to the checkpoint um, and start processing you guys. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. And I spoke pretty good English. He's like, wait, wait. And I was like, what's up, dude? And he's like, he's like, my family, my family. And I was like, yeah, your brother's right here. And he's like, no, 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 my, my wife and four kids, like, they're still down in the canal. And I was like, what the fuck do you mean they're down the canal? And I was like, and Hoover was still there at that time. He's like, what the fuck? And at some point he stepped stepped away. Um, and I was like, what do you mean your family's down the canal? And he's like, yeah, like my wife and four kids, like, they're down there. I was like, why aren't they with you? And he's like, well, we were scared. Like, we weren't going to get in. And I was like, well, do you have all their documents? And, he, you know, he pulled out passports. And, and I was like, fuck. Like, in my head, I was going through this eternal battle. I was like, fuck. I was like all right, dude, like, where are these, where are they at? And he was like, he points, you know, like 6,000 people away through this massive crowd. And all these mm. people who, you know, made it to the front of the crowd getting turned away are fighting back now. And all the other people are still trying to get to the front. So this crowd, I mean, it's taken days for people to get to the front. And, um, and if you've got a family and stuff, like a lot longer or you're not getting through at all sometimes. And uh, uh, I was like, man, I, in my head, I'm like, dude, your family is not fucking getting through. Oh my, oh my God. Like you're, you're, there's no way they're making it through this by the time we close the gate. But I'm like, okay, dude, like, listen, like, do, can you call them? Like, do, does she have a phone? Do you have a phone? He's like, yeah, yeah, I can call them. I was like, you need to tell them to get into the, you know, the, the shit water into the canal itself and start moving up. Cause that's the only way, like I can, we're going to be able to process you guys that through. That was nasty. It was, yeah, just human waste sewage. Um, I mean, that's how desperate people were to get out. Just they were in it, living in it. Yeah. And, um, he's like, okay. And he starts talking on the phone and um, I'm like asking him like like verify where she's at and still like five six thousand people away, <clears throat> and um, like, okay I'm like all right dude I'm gonna set you down the fence like I'm gonna stay down here with you you know maybe twenty thirty minutes and then I need to get back to what I'm doing but I'll make sure another individual another Marine's helping you out and is aware of what's going on. He's like all right thank you you know he was very grateful and uh, you know I'm like let me see the passports uh, like so I can see what they look like. <laughs> And I was like, okay, well, obviously they all fucking look the same kind of. And I'm like, all right, come here. And so I like brought him over and I stood on, you know, there was a, about a 12 to 15 foot gap from uh, like two foot high or about knee high canal, canal wall. Um, and then the water and then another little two foot high canal wall on the other side where people were standing. And um, 
I was like, all right, you're going to stand here with me because you're going you're gonna to recognize them so we can pull them out. And so I'm waiting there, you know, about 10 minutes, just kind of checking people's papers still. Everyone, you know, everyone out there has got fake documents or, oh, I worked with, you know, SEAL Team 6, blah, blah, blah. Like I was their interpreter, crap like that. Like hey, pull me out and all that stuff. And, you know, 90% of the people who were there, you know, had no reason to be there. They just wanted to get away from the They're Taliban. Away. And uh, that was that was the biggest challenge is, you know, f- you know that day, first day we were out there, we were f- fighting physically having to fight people because we've got all these you know military age males trampling people killing people when they open the gate physically fighting us and we're throwing them around trying to just like get some sense of you know control and order at the gate and uh, you know eventually got them back but um yeah that going back to 26 that that guy was standing next to me you know about 10 minutes went by and just saw a flash next time i opened my eyes i mean i felt this massive wave of pressure just hit me and hit me you know front like front on i was facing it um pretty close to the canal wall and uh I opened my eyes and i was on the ground and i mean the best the best way i would describe it's like watching saving private ryan like my left ear was just super muffled and i'm hearing all these screams and my right ear is super high pitched ringing and i knew right away i was like holy fuck like i just got blown up i was like i just got hit by a fucking bomb and like I couldn't, I was struggling to open my eyes and later found out, you know, obviously besides the obvious of the blast going off, you know, someone's CS cannon exploded on us. Um, pretty positive. My flashbang exploded on me. Um, and uh, I was just struggling to open my eyes and I opened my eyes and I mean, there's just fucking, you know, desert camo just laid out and, uh, you know, there's bodies everywhere. There's where this massive crowd of, you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people was, you know in front of us, you know, 50, 50 feet away is just flattened, um, kind of like sitting, like leaning my head up and I'm looking across the canal and same thing, just flattened. And I was like, holy fuck. Like I was just in disbelief. I wasn't even, you know, I, ha- I hadn't started feeling pain yet. I was just, you know, like stunned that this had just happened to me. And, and I remember I kept saying in my head, I was like, why me? Like, why me? Like, what the fuck did I do to deserve this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we started, we started taking, um, started taking fire from down in the canal um and uh i remember hearing rounds crack overhead and i just the f- first thought obviously you know i'm not thinking super clearly but the first thought that came to my head i was like fuck like i can't get shot and i kind of looked down a little bit knew i couldn't fucking like return fire or anything i was like i'm not getting fucking shot i wasn't even thinking like you know i, I think uh you know, everyone wants to be the hero, on their, the hero on their own story, but, you know, I wasn't like, oh, I need to fucking, like, assess myself and slap a fucking tourniquet on or whatever. I was just like, fuck, like, you know, didn't want to get shot if I couldn't fire back. And so I knew the f- hole in the fence was about, you know, 60, 70 yards behind me, and uh, I was like, I need to move that way. And so I just started trying to crawl. And I mean, you know, this is all in a span of a couple minutes, but I was trying to crawl, and I moved maybe a couple feet, and I was just like, man, like, why the fuck? I was like, my left leg's not working. I was like, why the fuck isn't my right arm working? I remember like lifting my arm up and it was there. It was just like exploded. You know I mean? It was, it was fucked up, um, you know, pretty, pretty fucking beat up and just limp. And I was like, you know, kind of matter of fact, I was just like, okay, that's why my arm isn't working. And so I kept trying to move. And uh, eventually it just like, you know, the trauma of the, of the injury just overwhelmed me and uh, I couldn't move anymore. And I remember I kept trying to like reach out and like sit up and I couldn't sit up or I couldn't get up. And I was just like, fuck. And I was laying there and, uh, you know, I'm here still hearing people. I'm seeing people run around in the distance. Um, I'm hearing people fucking just screaming. I remember at one point uh, before, um, you know, I fully realized that I thought I was crawling away from my leg. But it was someone else's fucking body part. Um, and, uh, you know, I was laying there and I was just like, fuck. Like, it, was, it hit me and I was like. I'm, I'm dead. Like, I knew I was bad. I remember I just seen myself just kind of soaked in blood, and I couldn't move, and I was like, if I can't fucking move, like, I know I just got blown up. Like, I'm probably fucking dead. Uh, and I, w- I wasn't even, you know, I wasn't even scared. I, you know, that's not me trying to, you know, be a tough guy bravado. I just kind of, like, was like, wow, like, I'm dead. That's it, kind of. And, uh, you know, I'm very – I will say one thing about that is I, uh, you know, in that moment, um, you know, I was starting to, starting to fade pretty hard, and I uh, just, just couldn't move, no one – People who were coming around were not coming to me, and uh, everyone to the left and right of me was dead. Um, and I was like, "Well, this is it," um, you know. And I, I was, you know, I, I'm thankful. I look back on that, and I'm like, "Wow, you know, I wasn't in that moment. Like, I've never been religious. I mean, I was religious growing up, but I have not been religious since." And uh, you know, we kind of discussed. It. I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I definitely consider myself a spiritual person. But uh, 
you know, I wasn't in that moment when I thought I, you know, I was going to die. I wasn't like God fearing. I wasn't scared of, you know, my mistakes in life. I was, I had accepted, you know, the man that I was. And at that point in my life, I had worked very hard to become a man I, I would be proud of, you know, and a man that my future kids would be proud of. And, you know, I, in that moment I was like, well, that's it, you know, that's all right. And that's just how it goes. And, uh, you know, I remember starting to fade and I just hear Tyler, Tyler. And I'm like, like, fuck, it kept me awake. And I was like, oh my God, it's fucking Chaz. I was like, it's fucking Chaz. Like he's, he's going to fucking get to me. And it kept me awake. And I mean, I know he's, he's a, he's a really fucking humble guy. He, he's sitting he, right. He's sitting right yeah, here. He's, <laughs> he won't, uh, he won't ever, uh, you know, attribute that, um, accomplishment to himself. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful to him for that. Um, you know, in that, in that moment, I definitely was like, wow, like I'm dead. But, um, <clears throat> you know, he hit him yelling, kept me awake. And, uh, you know, I don't remember him getting to me, <clears throat> like, vi like visually seeing him get to me. And, uh, I remember kind of like someone standing over me and then like yelling at me. Um, and I remember for a while I'd ask him when he came to visit me in the hospital post deployment. Uh, I was like, dude, I was like, I don't know what the fuck happened, but I just remember like, like moving really far, really fucking fast. Like, I think I dragged myself like 30 fucking feet really quickly. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck happened. He's like, no, dude, like I dragged you. It's like, <laughs> I fucking dragged your ass and you were fucking yelling. Like, I realized we couldn't move you like that. Cause I was all, I was fucked up my whole stomach. You know, I had a, I had a softball, softball sized hole ripped open in my stomach. You know, my, uh, you know, my left leg was sh shot through with ball bearings and shit. I had taken ball bearings all on my left shoulder and left peg through the wrist into my hand. Um, my arm too. Um, you you know, still got how many in you? Uh, fifteen. Fifteen. Ball yeah, bearings. I think I think thirteen of them are ball bearings and two of them are pieces, uh, shrapnel. Um, but yeah, um, I actually have I have I got one back. I got one back that I'm hopefully gonna turn into like a necklace or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I um, you know, I remember uh, I remember you know very specific moments from that. But um, uh, he you know he got to me and I remember him uh him telling me like. You know, I was, you know, telling him to take off my fucking belt and shit. Um, obviously, my belt was pushing on my, my fucking open stomach and stuff. I, and uh, I remember, I remember like just being in this just a, like unbelievably immense amount of pain. I mean, I'm, you know, I've talked to my buddies. I'm very, I'm very open to talking about it. Um, but, you know, I, I know I was fucking screaming. Like, it, I, you know, there's no real way around that. I was awake. <laughs> and, mm. um, and, you know, they, uh, the shock never really kind of kick in. Or it did, it, kick in it did later. Yeah, it did yeah. later once they moved me to the base of our tower. So, um, you know, a lot of guys go into shock right away and they don't feel much after the yeah. control. And then some people just feel everything, hear everything. And yeah, it was, I mean, I, I, you know, the, I definitely, the audio was big for me hearing people still. Um, and, uh, you know, bits and pieces of my visual memory. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just remember I was like, fucking even right before he got to me I, or maybe he was already on me but i was just like f like thinking like please fucking kill me like fucking kill me i'm in so much fucking pain like, oh. i just wanted to die i was in so much fucking pain did and, you hit in the uh, face at all or helmet? no i mean i got hit in that oh, i got hit in that kevlar um in the lip of my kevlar like right above it um but nothing nothing hit me so still mm. still somewhat handsome man um yeah, man. and uh yeah everything everything else hit me shoulders down um and uh you know Early on, I think it was our first mission that we got out there. We were we were, uh, we ripped out with uh, a one eight sniper team at this satellite tower and uh, went to go take my my first shit in Afghan and uh, it was pretty prominent because we our team Corman and I we had gone over to this like Connex box and he's like, hey dude, this thing's like full of tools and shit. And I was like, tools? I was like, what kind of tools? Like power tools or what? And he's like, oh, there's like this giant pair of bolt cutters in there and like uh, I was like, he's like, you want to keep this? And I was like, all right, we'll throw it in the back of the Bobcat. We hot wired. <clears throat> and uh and then he's like there's a smaller pair i was like oh give me that like i'll fucking hold on to the small pair of bolt cutters like we'll fucking use those at some point and uh you know um chaz uh the rest of our guys had just gotten back when the blast went off uh from the, from our rucks back at like four miles away and uh he was you know they were inside the vic just parked it at the base of the tower when the id went off and uh you know everyone kind of knew to consolidate the tower because that's where we were all working and you know he got up there I um, remember him, you know, everyone was saying like, like, okay, like here, here's all of us, like, fuck, like where's Tyler? And, uh, you know, Adam, one of our guys looked down and he saw me when I was still trying to like reach up and get up and sit up and like, he's fucking on the ground. So 
Chaz grabbed the bolt cutters, ran out there to me. Um, you know, him, one of the other platoon sergeants, um, Staff Sergeant Emmett, they, they, they were on me, working on me. Um, another two buddies of mine, um, Smith and Silas, they, they, you know, they helped out. And uh, Chaz could open the hole in the fence, cut down the casualty distance by probably, you know, 100 yards at least um, with those sand bolt cutters. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were, like, trying to figure out how to move me after, you know, as they were triaging me and stuff. And uh, my buddy, uh, Silas, he uh, he grabbed one of the rich right shields that was left behind. They threw me on a right shield, fucking carried me out, That's carried smart. me to the yeah, carried yeah. me to the base of the tower. Um, and I kind of came to again at certain points at the base of the tower. And I remember our uh, our team corpsman Jorge. He he was walking out to meet me actually originally right before the blast went off. And uh, you know where the the blast went off this way, he had just stepped past kind of like the cone of fire, and. Uh, the blast went off, so it knocked him on his ass, and he got up and started triaging people right away. I mean, kicking ass, doing his fucking thing, um, saving lives. And uh, he finally realized, like, oh, fuck, like, I went out there for Tyler and, like, met us over at the base of the tower. And I remember seeing him, and I was just like, was like fucking Jorge. Jorge's a corpsman. Jorge has fucking drugs. I'm like, Jorge, I need drugs. I was like, I need fucking drugs. And I don't remember if I fucking s- said all of that, but I remember seeing in my head, I'm like, I need fucking drugs. I need fucking drugs. <laughs> and he's like, Tyler, like, I need to finish fucking triaging you. And I just remember thinking, I'm like, fuck you, Jorge. I'm like, fuck you, dude. Like, give me fucking drugs. And, uh, you know, they kept triaging me, and he was he was drawing out ketamine, actually, uh, for me. And um, the medical officer out there was like, we need to fucking send him. Like, he's going to die. Like, if he doesn't fucking move now. And uh, by the time I got to the fucking, you know, the surgeons, uh, you know, they had to drive me four miles all the way around the fucking airport to get back to the medical center and um, uh, the roll two. And uh, I was in the back of our our, our uh, SUV that we had torn out the seats in the back and stolen. I mean, we stole out Vic by sticking a, our, one of our guys, Andrew, stuck a, stuck a knife from his multi-tool in the ignition and turned it on. Yeah, because you guys are hot wiring vehicles all day long, trying yeah. to make just be as resourceful as possible. Yeah, That's yeah. another thing I like, think a lot, a lot of people don't know is like, oh, the big military, we got all the assets. Like, no, you guys were finding them. I mean, went. we had guys stealing MRAPs out there too. I mean, that's how you know that's how it was. And uh, you know, they uh, they rode me back. Uh, one of one of our but my buddies Castillo, uh, he rode in the back with me, trying to kind of keep me from hurting myself because I was just writhing around in pain. And, you know, he's saying, I just kept saying, like, I need fucking drugs. Like, are we there yet? I need drugs. I need drugs. And I, I remember, like, the audio from that ride because I remember just, like, repeating it over and over and over again. And he was just like, you know, uh, he's like, we're going to get you real fucking high, buddy. Like, don't worry. <laughs> and uh, uh, I got to the, you know, the Roll 2 facility and the surgeons, you know, started working on me right away. And, uh, you know, they told they told Jorge I, I had, I had they were putting chest tubes in me and I had no blood return. I had essentially completely bled out. And uh, my heart just kept fucking going and like, you know, kept, stayed alive. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they're working on me and uh, uh, the guy, the guys, a funny, funnier story is the guys, uh, when they were able to pull off later from the gate, um, one of the, one of the platoon commanders and like, I think Chaz or some other guys that came to see me and whatnot. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting story because, you know, we were carrying, you know, kill cars with our zap numbers and stuff in all of our pockets and had obviously our kill patch on our, on our uh, plate carriers and whatnot, but they had confused me with, uh, with, um, Corporal Deacon Page. Um, they had put his kill patch on me and mine on him at a certain point. And, uh, our, one of the platoon commanders was like, Hey, like we're looking for a Marine, like Sergeant Marcus Andrews, like he's got a really nice mustache and like some really nice fucking hair. And like, that's what they fucking <laughs> told him. And they're like, well, you know, he's, he's passed basically. And they're like, what the fuck? Like he was, you know, we didn't know he was bad, but he wasn't, you know, dead the last we heard. And, uh, essentially, and, uh, they went out and went and found that, you know, like, Hey, this is, you know, no, this is like our guy, not him. And, uh, you know, that was that, but, um, yeah, they, they, uh, they worked on me by the time, you know, that day, uh, the next day, um, they flew me out on the, the night of the 27th, I believe, um, or the morning of the 28th, the launch duel. And uh, between between Afghan and Walter Reed, uh, three days later, I, or two days later, I had been given uh, 54 or 58 units of blood, something like that. It, mm. was, it was a pretty crazy number. But, yeah. Wow, man. So so people can understand, um, you know, obviously we lost 13 U.S. service members that day, but we lost – 
you know, 185 that they know of, you know, Afghans and other people, um, you're, you're talking over almost 250 people dead yeah. in this blast. How far away were you from that blast? About five meters. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they said that he was carrying uh, 20 pounds of military grade explosives packed with ball bearings, you know, kind of same way we pack Claymore. Around a satchel. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, I mean, you know, I, I told you about this earlier, but, you know, the, the surgeons, they told my mom, they told me the, the sole reason other than, you know, not taking ball bearings to the face and the neck that I survived was because of my, my level of fitness, my, my physical health. And I mean, you know, that was, that was pretty, uh, pretty surreal to hear. I had to ask him if he was joking like four times. Cause he's like, the surgeon's like, no, no, it, it's very fucking real. You're, you, the only reason you sustained your injuries and you lived was because of that. You know, I crashed like six fucking times. I died a couple times and kept like, kept coming back, kept going. And, uh, they had no reason why they had my mom come in and say goodbye to me twice. I think, you know, she had to sit there and, you know, fucking cry over me and say goodbye because they're like, he's going to die. And before she even got to me, they're like, Hey, like, don't, don't come to Germany yet. You know, he's going to die essentially. You know, we don't want you to pass his body going back. If you come here and we send him back yeah, it's mom, for a mom. Yeah. My mom, I mean, she's a, she's a tough fucking woman. She, uh, you know, going through all the, the hardships that we did at a young age, you know, or at a young age for me, um, you know, she had me at, she got pregnant with me at 19, I think, had me at 20, raised me as a single mom, um, went through the stuff with my biological father, and, uh, you know, she busted her ass to protect our family, went bankrupt in the process, built her whole business up again, and is extremely successful uh, family law attorney now and owns her own firm, has like 40, 50 employees, like kick-ass. She's really kick-ass. I mean, you know, people are always like, you know, growing up, like, oh, who's your idol? Who's your hero? And, like, honestly, like, my mom's my fucking hero. Like, for real. She, uh, I mean, she, you know, she taught me, like, all the struggle and strife that, that you go through in life. Like, there's not a, a fucking reason why you can't be successful. I watched her struggle. I watched her fucking fight tooth and nail to have the things that she has now. And, you know, she's very successful and very accomplished. You know, probably the best, best family law attorney in California. You know, she has a specialization in it. And uh, she gives back too, you know, she creates with the situation my biological father, um, you know, she's, you know, got legislation put in place for protecting kids with, through CPS and things like that. And um, because of that scenario and stuff, she's done a lot to give yeah, back. That's needed more than ever. Yeah. Dude. Well, good job, mom. Yeah. <laughs> Damn sure. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's awesome. But uh, yeah, when they, when, when the Marine Corps told her that, um, you know, they, they called her and they alerted her, and that was a big thing because they told her right away, like, hey, you know, he's hurt. He's pretty pr – they described it as, like, he's very, very critically sick. And, uh, you know, he was in – they they said this word for word in the prompt that they read to her. You know, he was an IED attack with a complex uh, – or an IED explosion and a complex attack. And they told her that word for word. You know, you know people have been shot, people have been killed, people were blown up. Um, and uh, she was like, okay, well, I'm coming. They're like, no, don't come. She's like – fuck you, that's my son, like, I'm going to fucking Germany, and she fucking, they're like, well, you're not going to get reimbursed, and she's like, I don't give a fuck, like, I'm going to see my son, and fucking flew, her, flew herself to Germany, um, got there, and uh, they kept me sedated from, you know, from the night of the 26th, when they put me to sleep, that was actually my last, my last memory of uh, being awake was, I remember I was on the table, or I was on some stretcher or something, and I just see these people standing above me, and I'm like, kind of looking around, just in pain still, and, uh, like, all right, we need to sedate him right now. Like, we need to intubate him. And I knew what that meant. I was like, I said, I was like, fuck no. I was like, fuck you guys. I was like, you're not putting a tube down my fucking throat. And uh, and they're like, hold his head down. I, I remember, like, honestly, that was the one traumatic thing through that whole fucking thing. They, like, <laughs> held my head down. And I'm just, like, shaking, like, crying. I'm like, fuck you guys. Fuck you guys. Those poor fucking bastards will probably never forget me. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, they intubated me. And I'm sure Good. they got, like, I remember they got the tube into my mouth. And it was probably pushing drugs at the same time. But I blacked yeah. out. And then... Uh, woke up, you know, on the, like, September, they woke me up on, like, September 2nd at Walter Reed, um, or the 1st, um, but, yeah, they, my mom flew out there, was with me, you know, there they had her say goodbye to me, and it was a really, a really cool moment for my mom was, you know, she obviously, um, you know, like yourself, grew up through, you know, was, was an adult when 9-11 happened, and, um, you know, I was, like, three years old, and I remember seeing it on TV, and just, like, my mom was really sad, and, you know, we, we hung, like, red, white, and blue wreaths outside our, our apartment and stuff, and, uh, you know, for her, she even expressed this to me. Uh, she was like, you know, it was crazy because, you know, I grew up, 
you know, we grew up with 9-11, you know, being the biggest, ca- like, catalyst of this, of this, uh, of this war. Um, and, you know, it was, she was like, everyone has their own biases and stuff on how they view, you know, Middle Eastern people or whatever, you know. And uh, every time you get on a plane, you worry about it, stuff like that. And uh, she was like, it was very surreal because when we got to the launch stool and they flew us back to, um, to, Walt- to, to here, to, um, to Maryland uh, or to D.C., they put her on a plane with, with me, uh, with one of the injured, Jacob Bear, um, and hundreds of refugees, hundreds of refugees from, from Germany that we had, we had helped, um, you know, escape, escape tyranny, escape the Taliban. And she realized it and she was like, she said at first, she's like, oh fuck, like, is this plane going to blow up? Like, but then she looked over and she saw this, you know, this, uh, this mom about the same age as her. And she was just like, tear tear streaking very sad and like holding the hand of this little kid in the hospital bed and then she looked like to the left a little more and saw she was three more beds stacked up on top of each other like bunk beds and she like went over to her and she realized it was like her kids like her four kids who were injured in the blast and she was like kind of pointing like hey like is this you know is this your are these your kids and the mom was like the Afghan mom was like like one two three four like pointed at him like mine and my mom like pointed at me and she was like that's my kid. And they just like held hands and cried. And she told me, she was like, that was the first moment I realized like, this is, this is what my son's doing. This is what they're doing. This is, this is, you know, why this had to happen, unfortunately, but all these people have a life now. And, uh, you know, that was huge for her. And it was honestly like made me tear up when she first told me that it was a huge moment. Yeah, I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't, I was like, wow. I was like, Told her, I was like, thank you for, for telling that me that. It just shows the, again, the nobility in what everybody was doing there, <clears throat> you know, and it sometimes takes that, that's catalytic, you know, that, that I'm sure she'll never forget that. If people yeah. listening can probably just can kind of visualize that for a second, hopefully, and sit with that and be present with that for a second. I mean, that's tough. Fuck. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, go back to your health. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to talk about really quick cuz definitely. Um you know, I've seen a lot of guys that are messed up and 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 some of them bounce back quick, some of them don't. Uh and you were in, in impeccable shape cuz I remember seeing pictures of you before you went over <clears throat> cuz you were like 205 something pounds, yeah. right? And you were lifting heavy, you were really in good shape and um and I think that's something to be important cuz there's a lot of people out there that ask what can I do to make to be a better asset yeah. as a responsible <clears throat> armed citizen, as a father, as a son, as a Military guy as a cop. Um, how important is that? I mean, it's, it's, fuck, it's, uh, I mean, work and fitness. Uh, that was my life. You know what I mean? I mean, and that was, uh, obviously I didn't have, I didn't have a family. Um, otherwise that would be a priority. But I, uh, you know, I think, you know, Mike, my, something Mike says, uh, he's like, if you're not fit, you're going to die, right? Or whatever. He says, it's like, not fit, you're going to fucking die. And honestly, like, it's the fucking truth. Um, you know, as a, as a young, uh, as a young corporal squad leader, uh, before I moved to, stay i uh i always tried to like preach that like you know i would kick my own dick in you know above my guys you know i held my guys at the same standard i held myself and uh i knew i was like i you know i want to be an asset i don't want to be a fucking liability and i still hold that you know and i you know i, I look at my life as like i will never be a fucking victim and i still don't consider myself a victim you know i'm, I'm a casualty of war sure but i'm you know, i'm not a fucking victim and i'll never let myself be that and uh i you know that the, the quote that I always go back to is, you know, uh, you can never train too hard for a job that can kill you. And I took that very seriously. And a lot of guys do, I think, um, you know, maybe not necessarily put a quote to the, to the, the, the lifestyle, but that, that's the truth. And, uh, you know, I, it was a hard thing for me because, you know, I got injured. I lost, you know, I, my, my aspirations and my goals were, were to go to, go to Marsoc. And I had turned down sniper school twice to go to assessment and selection. And the first time I got injured and the second time there was some, some bullshit that happened. But, um, you know, I was always, physical fitness was huge for me because I was like, you know, I, I, I'll be the motherfucker that carries the heavy rock. I'll be the motherfucker that carries the gun or whatever. You know, like, I, if I need to run with my buddy on my back for two miles, I'm going to be able to fucking do it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fucking... Um, have to rely on someone else. Your physical abilities and acuity is going to obviously increase your mental yeah. abilities and, and acuity. Without a doubt. Yeah, it's huge. Um, no, it's a good, I think it's a great call to action for everybody out there. Is mm-hmm. to, and like you said, like Mike says something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I remember him saying something like, well, in the worst situation of your life, which will happen to yeah. everybody, whether it doesn't have to be a gunfight, it could be something else. Um, 
you're going to wish you were the baddest motherfucker in the world. Damn right. You will in that moment. Yeah. And, then, and I think that's where a lot of us sometimes get regrets when we don't take care of ourselves. We don't put ourselves first, right? Um, and we talked about this in past podcasts. And a lot of people probably go, what do, you, what do you mean? You don't put yourself first. You always put others first. No, you don't. That's not yeah. the definition of vulnerability, man. You know, you got to take care of yourself so you can give to other people. Because, exactly. you know, if you're not at your best. You're not going to give your best to other people. Yeah. It, it doesn't help anyone. Yeah. It doesn't help anyone if you're not your best. And and I think that's what we were talking about earlier. Like when people say, well, you're fine the way you are. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, I'm not. Yeah. Like, you know, JP always says, no, fuck, why would you ever accept the fact that you're okay with the way you are? I'm not saying you got to strive for perfect because there's no such thing as perfection, but yeah. strive for excellence every day. Lift a load, man. Like, so you can tolerate yourself. You that, know? That, that, and, that whole fuck, fuck mediocrity. Yeah. 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 Well, man, um, how are you dealing with all this now? And I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. how, like sit with that for a second. Like, how are you, how are you dealing with all this? And biggest question that I hear and, 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 and cause I hear a lot of guys say this and it, it bothers me. Um, they'll say, what's it all worth? Yeah. Right. So with you, you know, how are you dealing with this now? Um, and was it worth it? And, yeah. and what, what message would you give to others that might be sitting in, in, not in your shoes, right? Because your shoes, I think, are a little different, which you're here, you're talking about this, yeah. uh, you know, just a year, almost the anniversary, right? After this event happens where most guys are trying to figure out their lives and what they're going to do. So, like, what what is that? Like, how does this, how does this affect you moving forward? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, um, one, uh, you know, I think, I'd like to think that I carry the weight of this well, Um and the way I look at it, you know, I, I feel like I don't have a choice not to. And that's just, you know, that's the way my mom raised me. That's that's who I am. But, um, you know, everyone goes through different, goes through differently, whether it's physical injury or mental injury. Um, you know, I, I definitely, I had my rough moments in the hospital. Um, you know, I always t- try to put on a brave face for my mom. And, uh, you know, she always tried to do the same for me. But, you know, she, you know, finally when she would start, like, leaving at night, you know, I had, I had countless nights where I cried myself to sleep, you know. I was just like... I had to let it out. I had to get it out. Um, you know, it was like all the all the goals and aspirations that I had in the military, um, you know, they were over. And not not my goals in life, but but you know, the goals that I did have for for my time that I wanted to continue in the military, they were over. And there's you know, there's no way around that. Um, that was hard to come to terms with. That was very fucking hard. And uh, you know, it wasn't so much so like, oh, my legs are gone, my arms gone, and I'm missing half of my organs. It was like I can't live the life in the military that I wanted to live and that I had so aspired to, to do. And, uh, you know, I've, I've come to terms with that. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been able to, in, in multiple different ways, continue what I, what I joined the military to do is to help, you know, help others and give back to the world and positively impact people's lives. And there's no reason I can't continue to do that. And, uh, I strive to do that every day, every time that I, every, every opportunity that I get, you know, I still tr- strive to do that. And, uh, you know, that's kind of my purpose going forward. You know, the whole, like, you know, what's your purpose in life? Like, you know, your purpose in life is whatever the fuck you want to make it, you know? And I feel like that's, that's a thing a lot of, you know, a lot of people might not realize, like, you know, what, what, like, what are we here for? Well, you're here for whatever the fuck you want to do. Build a family, you know, build a great life, give back to the world or don't, whatever you want to do. But, you know, I, on the, on the question of, you know, was it worth it? It, uh, you know, it, it was worth it. And uh, it's hard, and that's a hard fucking thing, you know. I mean, to some people, it's not, you know. To the to the thirteen families, it's like, you mm. know, I would give anything back to have my fucking son or daughter here. You know, any of those families would would give give anything to have their son or daughter in my position. And I look at that every day. I'm like, well, I can't, you know, I can't be a fucking bitch. Like, I can't, I can't not lead a successful life. I can't do, I can't not do the things that I want to do, you know, for them. I I was always like that before. You know, I was like, I'm never gonna let something stand in my way, but even more so now because any any one of those 13 you know their families would love to have their son or daughter in this position and i'm like well you know what i'm gonna go fucking live a, live a kick-ass life for them you know i uh i got to go do a, an excursion a diving uh certification with ranger road this past weekend with some buddies and uh they're awesome awesome group of individuals but um you know, I was able to get open water dive certified and I ran through the whole course. It wasn't an adaptive course. A couple, one of my other buddies, Hunter, uh, who's also a uh, sergeant in the Marines, he, you know, he's amputated at the shoulder and, uh, he and I both did it one handed, you know, we did, went through the whole certification one handed, just figured out ways to modify putting our gear on and stuff. But 
mm. we did it. And, uh, you know, I was able to get, take some pictures underwater with, you know, with a memorial bracelet with their names on it. And it's like, you know, like I, I, uh, you know, not everyone always wears, you know, wears these bracelets for the right reasons, but definitely, you know, it's, it's a way for me to carry them for the things that I do in my life. And, you know, the, the things that I'm successful for, you know, I'm doing it for them. I'm doing it for myself, but I'm doing it for them. That's awesome, dude. What was the name of that company? The dive company? Uh, Ranger Road. Ranger uh, yeah, Road, so yeah. they they're not just a dive company, but they do it. They uh, yeah, it's it's ran by a guy named Mikhail. Um, he uh, Mikhail Venikov. He, he's a great dude. He they reach out to guys at Walter Reed and do you know uh, skiing trips, like dive trips, things like that. They do all kinds of stuff, and they they really give back in a lot of a lot of positive ways. Um, yeah, that's, that's their whole, They're based off of you know helping helping veterans, helping active duty service members, wounded warriors, things like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely put their link down there for for guys because I know there's a lot of guys out there that don't even know about that stuff. Yeah. Um, and that that doesn't help their purpose in life or trying to find something for them to, yeah. uh, again, do the warrior off gas, which is in, in critically important. No, definitely, and, it is. And uh, what what is, you know, we were just talking to Robert Bruce, one of our other guys here, who who is a you know a dual amp from Afghanistan as well, and he. He always talked about guys in the hospital that were just done with their lives. It was over. There was no purpose anymore. And then there's there's the small percentage that he says, the, the one or two percenters. And I, I believe I know you're in that category because, dude, this less than a year and you're already bouncing back. I'm watching you doing, you know, deadlifts and you're lifting again in the gym and you're you're kicking ass. What what is something that because that might just be natural for you to go, hey, I've always had this purpose to serve, and I'm going to continue to serve. If I can't yeah. do the military, I'm going to do it in some other way by sharing these stories, helping other people, foundation work, whatever that stuff is. That's still serving in, yeah. in probably even a bigger way than what, what you have ever done in the military. Um, yeah, that's how I feel now. I'm, I'm far removed from the military, but that's been yeah. a while for me. Um, but I'm still serving every single day in this country to make it a better place because that's what I want for myself. That's what I want for my children. Uh, but those people that are stuck, man, in that rut – that can't cross that that chasm, that gap to get to where your mindset is. Is there anything that you would you would tell them? You know, any, any direction you give them? Or yeah, I think um, <clears throat> you, know, you know, we obviously we spoke earlier about you know, kind of it's hard to help people that don't want to help themselves. But you know, I mean, the best way I can look at it is like what I tell myself every day. You know, every any time I'm having a hard moment, it's like there's someone who has it fucking worse. There's someone who's not here. There's there's triple, there's quadruple amputees, there's guys who are paralyzed, and there's men and, like, men and women with way worse off than I am. And, uh, you know, whether it's the mental battle or it's the physical battle, um, you know, I think that's that's a big way to look at it is, like, there is someone who has it worse. And not to diminish anything that anyone goes through and anyone struggles with, but, you know, I feel like that, for myself personally, that's that's what I hold, you know, when I have a hard, a hard moment and stuff, that's, that's what I'm like, I'm like, shitty fucking day, I'm like, God damn, I'm like, all right, like, suck the fuck up. Like, there's there's 13 guys who aren't here. There's a lot more than that, but 13 guys that, you know, were in the same fucking ID blast as me. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to be as serious as that, but, um, you know, people who are struggling, you know, I think it's it's harsh, but it is a reality is, you know, there are people who are worse off, you know, and it doesn't mean shut it down and don't feel the pain that you're feeling, but reach out and get help. You know, there's someone who fucking cares. There is, there is someone who cares. And, uh, I, I mean, you know, I, like, I care, you know, my, I recently have had buddies reach out to me finally, you know, after a year, you know, who were struggling mentally with stuff that, you know, we went through out there and I, I told him, I was like, I'm fucking proud of you guys. <laughs> I don't want to fucking go to your fucking funeral. You know, like I, I, uh, you know, I'm fucking proud of you guys for reaching out. That's, that's a big fucking thing. Like yeah. it's a hard thing to do. Cause like, you know, we talked about no one, we're always the guys that, um, that help others and want to help others and being that guy who needs help that fucking hurts. That fucking sucks. And well, it's like uh, I said, it's the hardest word for a man to ask is help. Yeah, you know? and it is, and it's it's a very real thing. But you know, take that and take that. Uh, you know, that whole there's someone who has it worse, and go get that fucking help because there's someone who who would give anything to be here today who's not. You know, yeah. or someone who has a really bad injury or whatever. You know, neurological issues, and whatnot. Who who would give anything to to be hurting? Yeah, it's like the you know suck it up buttercup. And, and I, I want to make sure there's a, a good distinction here yeah. between this because, uh, you know, a lot of us still will think that yeah. you know, when we're in trouble, we're hurting, uh, whether it's physically or mentally. <clears throat> and uh, so you tell yourself, suck it up, buttercup. You know, when, when you say that, I don't think you mean it like in a non-vulnerable way. You're, you're vulnerable, yeah. right? Which we, you know, we, we talk about all the time is that's that's the ability to open yourself up for criticism or attack where weakness is the 
inability to withstand an attack. And I, I, I love the distinction between those two things because they are two completely polar opposite definitions of they each are. other. And and I think we get them confused, especially in the military. And, and I'm not going to be vulnerable in a gunfight, right? Yeah. But in my time where I need to be vulnerable as a second attribute of the warrior and you know studying warrior culture, warrior history for thousands of years, that's what made them was the ability to sit and, and tell this story. That's why, I, I, dude, I acknowledge you so much for coming here and, and sharing it. these things. Um, and, and hopefully that's a catalyst for others out there that that can be saved yeah. by them saving themselves because they need to help themselves first, but they do need some type of motivation, some inspiration, um, and some purpose. And there's plenty of purpose out there, man, because a lot is. of guys look cool, like you. Like, I was a career Marine, and now my, my goals and you know, and, and, and MARSOC and everything else and ambitions are, are, are crushed. No, they're not. Yeah. Because as you know, everything happens for a reason. Um, and, it, and it happens exactly the way it happens and it didn't happen yeah. any other way. Why? Because it didn't. So, you know, the resistance of that, I think to the other part of this, um, is suck it up buttercup could be one of two things it means resist what I'm going through and be strong, which will kill you yeah. <laughs> quicker than quicker than a bullet. Yeah. Um, or, realize that acceptance mm -hmm. of what has happened and now what do I do with the rest of my life because the military doesn't define my entire life. It's a part of my character. It's a part of your character. It's part of everybody's yeah. character that serves, but it shouldn't define the rest of your life and what you're going to do to serve people. You know, And I think that's the big distinction there is that that is not suck it up buttercup. That's vulnerability. That's a real warrior spirit that comes out that says, hey, we should talk about this when we get back to the campfire around the teepees, you know, and, and make sure that we're good before we go back and put that chaos and corruption of war on our communities, our family, yeah. our own children, man. You know, and that's hard today, too, as you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier where we've been in gunfights and we get on a plane, we come home and like two days later, I'm walking in trying to. You know, I'm still shaking because I want to get in the shit still, you know, and I'm yeah. trying to hold this child like, what? Uh, okay, I'm home, but I'm not really home. Yeah. You know, like that, there needs to be an off-gassing moment to that. Uh, yeah. And you don't get the opportunity to do that anymore. So we have to find it in that, in our own time. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely, uh, like you said, the, the acceptance piece. I think, you know, the whole, the, that, that acceptance piece of the suck it up buttercup is, you know, you know, if reaching out and get that help, like getting that help in whatever way that is mentally or physically, like that's something to be fucking proud of, you know, and that's, yeah. I think that's something that people need to need to realize is there's, there's no reason to feel bad about that. That's something to be fucking proud of. Cause that's the hard shit. That's the hard thing to fucking do is ask for that help. And when you get it and you realize, man, it wasn't really that hard to ask for help. You, you become almost liberated from the resistance, yeah. which is the precursor to suffering. Um, and then when you accept it, you are, I believe, and, and most clinical psychologists will tell you this, that it's the only way to reconcile with any of that suffering that you have. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's a huge call to action, man, for, for sharing that with people and, uh, and and getting them out of that rut because a lot of us go, hey, dude, if you can't help yourself, then okay, later. Well, the problem is you have to help yourself, yeah. and but we still can inspire and empower and motivate those people, maybe even educate them to the point where there's still purpose out there, man. You know, Just because you're missing a part of yourself or a part of your, you know, figure, your body, um, doesn't mean you're incapable. I mean, look yeah. what you're doing, man. Um, that's what inspired me so much about Bruce's story when you just met him was uh, that guy bounced back and was taking weapons classes 17 months later. And I was like, yeah. what? <laughs> Why are you here? Yeah. He said, because I want to serve. Fuck yeah. And I want to continue to serve um, because I've accepted what I chose to do in my life. And it's that's a part of my his DNA, his character, your character. Yeah. Um, hard question. Would you do it again? Yeah, I, uh, without a doubt, I would. Really? You know? And, uh, you know, I've, I've Why? Because I think a lot of people might, when they hear that, like, fuck that, I wouldn't do that again, leadership and this and, after, and, and you know, politics yeah. and everything else. Like, why would you ever do that again, Tyler? Definitely. Why would you do that again? Yeah, for me, it's the, uh, you know, the, the whole, the whole, you know, that it was worth it to me. And, you know, to kind of allude to that is, I think a, a very specific story that I have from when we were out at the gate is it was the first day we were out at the gate when we had finally um, kind of started sectioning off people and we had gotten two SUVs up to the gate entrance to, you know, funnel people through one or two at a time. This this little girl um, somehow squeezed her way through the crowd of hundreds of people and uh, she was, you know, just torn clothes, just covered, you know, with dirt and grime and blood and tears and she had a little three or four month old baby in her arm and she had a, her little brother's hand that she was holding that was like five years old, four years old. And she's just sobbing. And I was like, 
I, I'm just, you know, I just fought off like five, or six dudes trying to like keep people in check. And I was like, just so shocking. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I need to help this little girl. And so I took the baby. I picked up the little boy and I was like, come this way. And the baby's face was blue. I was like, oh fuck, like this baby's not breathing. And uh, we had behind like one SUV, a few, few, uh, you know, like 100 meters back or 50 meters back. There was, uh, I don't know if it was, I don't even remember if it was like an international medic from some foreign nation or if it was one of the PJs out there. But some, some medic was behind an SUV and I was like, hey, hey, like, do you have like a small BVM? Like this baby's not breathing. Like we need to resuscitate this baby. And I was able to stay there and help, help hand him shit and got the baby <laughs> face turned red started crying and i was like fuck wow i was like wow and and this little girl i sat the little boy down the little girl is like eight years old she's just looking at me she's grabbing me like sobbing she's like abba abba like asking for her dad and i was like like your dad and, and i was like dad dad like papa and she, she's like nodding and just sobbing and i was like <laughs> in that moment i was i don't know why i was just like i'm finding your fucking dad like i'm gonna <laughs> find your fucking dad and uh and just not really thinking right but i was like i'm gonna do it and i picked her up and i took her back to the fucking gate and uh, I set her down. I climbed up on the hood of the SUV, and there are these two like Turkish Marines that are on top, just screaming and screaming at these people. And he, he like looks at me, and he's like screaming broken English, like get the fuck off the car. And I'm like, get the fuck out of the way. Like I'm trying, I'm trying to help this little girl. And I'm like pointing at her, and he grabs me, and he's like, get the fuck off the car. And I just threw him off the car. I was like, fuck you, dude. Like I'm fucking helping this little girl. And his buddy turned around and looked at me, and he's like. I was like, get the fuck off the car. And he just like hopped down. So I picked the little girl up and climbed on top of the SUV. And uh, and I'm like, fuck. And I'm looking at this crowd. I'm looking over the razor wire with this little girl. And there's just like, you know, hundreds of people just looking up at me. And I'm like, fuck. Like, how am I going to find this little girl's dad? And I'm just like, like, do you see your dad? Like your papa, abba, abba. Like, do you see him? And she's like kind of pointing. And all these people are like yelling, holding out papers, reaching at us. And there's this one guy with his hands on his head looking at her, just sobbing. Like 20, 30 people back just sobbing and she's like kind of pointing at his direction and I'm like that's her fucking dad like that is her fucking dad and I, there's like some some British um some of the British pair guys down there and some some a couple of marines and I'm like hey like I need you guys to create a fucking funnel I'm trying to get this little girl's dad and uh they fucking got the funnel through pulled the guy through he had all the paperwork for for this family and uh that moment you know to me that uh you know that was worth it and that was my 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 re one of my reasons why why I would do it again without hesitation and uh, you know like I, I I said this earlier is you know if I had to give more I would and uh, that family those three kids are gonna have a future you know I and I'm not the sole reason that they're gonna have that future but I was yeah, one big, of the reasons to be able to part of it man to be able to positively impact their lives and reunite that family and you know that family is gonna be you know in the U S or whatever you know allied nation. And they're gonna have a future, and those three kids are gonna have a future. I would, I would fucking, I would give my other two limbs for that fucking family. You know, I, I, uh, that family is hopefully never gonna forget that. I'm never gonna forget them. That's incredible, man. That's awesome, dude. Wow. I think that's an interesting lens to look through. That's hard for other people to look through unless they've actually seen that. Yeah. Um. And I think that's where everybody gets clouded by the bullshit and politics and, and the, 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 of course, yes, the higher up level of, of ignorance and decision making, especially in those types of situations. You know, I, I don't, I don't envy any leader in those high positions that have to make command decisions like that. Yeah. Um, and, and regardless if they, we believe they're good or bad, it's like, let's, let's draw that line between the guys and gals that are out there putting foot to ass for their country and other people's countries. Cause that's the reason why we go there is not to just create harm and discontent and disruption and, and war. It's to save people's lives. Yeah, I mean, it is. I think you can even look at your career, look at mine. Um, after all the Marine expeditionary units I was on everything, most, okay. I can say 1% of my career may have been combat operations. You know, it's a lot of it. Um, but dude, 99% of it was humanitarian efforts and yeah. helping people, bringing food to people. Like that's what we do. And a lot of people don't see that. And, um, and I think that, that, that kind of taints the American image of the American military because of the assholes that are making it bad does. decisions. Yeah. And then we have to deal with the consequences. And so to ask somebody that, would you do that again with all the shit that's going on in the world? Absolutely. Yeah, I would too. Um, it's just like Hunter's brother, Owen, you know, we had him in here and, you know, and his brother passed that day. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, he's like, I'm joining the army. Like a week was a week later. It goes, now he's in the army. I just met him the last yeah. weekend. We were out hanging out it's and shooting awesome. together. And, 
Um, and he's kind of got that same mentality as you do. Like, what if not me, then who? Right? Like the, exactly. like the, the um, Travis Mannion concept. Yeah. Um, that's incredible, man. Yeah. Wow. How are the families doing? I, mean, I know you keep in touch with the families. I try, I try to. I don't, I don't talk to all of them. My mom, uh, you know, her and some of the other um, mothers of, like, the injured, uh, the wounded warriors, they, they, uh, they reach out pretty often. But, you know, I talk to, I talk to them where, where I can. Um, obviously, um, I get an inf- quite an influx of, of messages and stuff and people trying to talk to me. But I, when I can, I try and reach out. And I think, um, you know, every family is going through their own stuff. Some, some are talk about it more than others. Um, but from what I've seen, um, you know, Hunter was a buddy of mine. We went to, went to infantry school together with uh, David trailer and they went to fast together. And then I just went straight to the fleet. Um, but you know, that, that, uh, I think, I think for a lot of them, you know, they, they realize like, Hey, not all of them, I can't speak for all of them, but some of them realize like, you know, you know, my son or daughter was out there helping these people, you know, and, out of every tragedy, you know, there's always some light in some way, and a lot of foundations, like Hunter, Hunter, uh, Hunter the Hunter Lopez Memorial Foundation, for example, mm-hmm. right? Has you know that that fund has been created now because of this that never would have been there, and you know it's a way to give back. And there's you know multiple other organizations, and um, you know money that's been raised, people that have been helped because of this tragedy, not just the Afghans, that, the refugees that were pulled out, but um, you know people because of because of the lives lost, the American lives lost. And, uh, you know, people who are going to get help because of money raised and, you know, organizations started that never would have previously. And I think that's that's a thing to hold on to, um, you know, that the families have to hold on to. It's like, well, you know, fucking, you know, it's, it's a hard shit. It's, you know, my son, my son and daughter lost their life, but, you know, there is there is good and it'll, it'll probably never be worth it to them. But, you know, I think, you know, that's something to hold on to from them is that. There is some good that has come out of this, not just not just the family saved, but yeah. things that have been created because of this tragedy. Yeah, because of that sacrifice, which makes this country what it is. Yep, it does. Yeah. And uh, and that's hard for a family that goes through that. And uh, to find the nobility in it again. Yeah. And I think if you and, and everybody continues to share in that world, that's a forum, um, we'll give them more hope, more light, and, uh, and, and more inspiration to, to realize what their child really truly did, not just what the government made them do. And I think that's a, that's not a good idea, you know? So if, if that can help anybody out there listening, that's in that, that situation, there's always nobility. Yeah. It's, it's always there, man. Th- those people and, you know, those Marines, sailors, soldiers, you know, they wanted to be there. They wanted to help. And I, I know every single person has a story out there who, who worked at the gates, you know, similar to mine in some way, you know, of that little girl in the family, but Everyone I've talked to has yeah. got that same almost exact story, man. Yeah. So I know everybody was impacted like that. Yeah, and that's that's something that they're never going to forget. And I know for me it was an honor. So I know I know it was an honor for them as well to positively impact those people's lives. You know, th- those those men and women, the lives lost, the lives that you know, the men that are men and women that are still here. You know, it goes for both. You know, it was for them. It was worth it. Yeah. Well, last question. All right. All right. Um, with everything you've been through in your life in general, with growing up mom and the whole, you know, you know, dad, the picture and all that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, your life joining the Marine Corps, going out and serving your country, um, getting to this point in this phase where you're at right now. I, I typically ask people at the end of every podcast, what have you sacrificed to get here? And <laughs> it's probably pretty obvious what you, you specifically have sacrificced. Yeah. Um, you know, not just mind, but body. Um, so with that, I guess it's kind of obvious. So maybe a different question. What does Tyler Vargas Andrews fear now after what you've gone through? So I think, I think for me, um, you know, something that's, uh, you know, again, be, being vulnerable, I think something, you know, you could probably relate to pretty well is I've always had, you know, regardless of a fear of failure, um, you know, what what, stri- what I've always strived to be successful in my life and be the man that I, you know, that I want to be proud of is because I, I fear not being a good person for my, my family in the future, not being a good person for my family now. You know, I, I, I want to be able to provide for my family. I want to be able to, you know, give back to my mom because she's given so much to me and my family. You know, that's, 
I'm like, fuck, I have to be successful. I can't, I can't fail in this life because my mom has done so much for me and my siblings. I've, I got to buy her house one day. You know what I mean? Like I, I, uh, I, I definitely, you know, that a fear of, a fear of not being able to give back to my family is huge. My, my current family and my future family. I, I think that's, that's something that pushes me towards, towards my goals and towards what I, I would, you know, never going to reach that, you know, that perfection, but being what I would consider a good man, I, I definitely, um, you know, I'm fearful of not being able to fulfill that, but I know I will. And I think, you know, you will because of that fear. Yeah. And that's a good thing. I, I think personally, I think fear is, um, fear is a motivator, mm-hmm. not for all. Fear is a motivator for, I, I can tell with you, um, to make you make the right decisions in life. Because I think you're closer to, to knowing, well, you already died a couple of times, I guess. So <laughs> you already realize how, how precious and, and yeah. how fragile life really is. And so that mere fact of, of us knowing that we will die one day, the Memento Mori concept. Yeah, I've um, got a tattooed on me. <laughs> yeah, it will, will hopefully drive your thoughts, your words, and actions to become a good man. Um, it's just false evidence appearing real. As somebody told me what fear mean, means at one point in time, and I was like, I'll never forget that. Yeah. Um, but it can certainly mess with you. It can make you procrastinate. It can make you run the other direction. Um, but if it's positive fear, I think you're going to go far, brother. Yeah, I appreciate that. You're going to help a lot of fucking people because you're inspiring, you're empowering, you're educating people, and you're sharing. And man, it's an that. honor to know you. No, thank you. Seriously. Means a lot. Thanks, bro. Thanks for coming out today. Of course. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you. Yeah. Appreciate you as well.